So, <laughs> the network is running slow. Right, here we go. So we're looking at week, uh, this is week 13, chapters 12 and 13. All right. <clears throat> While we're bringing up the slides today, Please go ahead and make sure you have IntelliJ open. We're going to go through some examples, and uh, it's better for you guys that way. All right. So exceptions. There's always exceptions to the rule, right? You ever heard that statement before? The idea here with um, exceptions in programming is there, there are some things that you'll do that will actually cause the program, whether it be the user's input or the way you've coded it, will cause the program to uh, throw an error and, and terminate. A very uh, popular example of this is maybe dividing by zero. Dividing by zero will actually throw an exception. Um, other exceptions maybe have to do with um, the user uh, input coming in, say for example, through a, a scanner. So you're expecting, say you're converting a text into a number and you expect the user to enter a text and they enter, um, uh, excuse me, you expect them to enter a number and they enter text instead. Well, you can't convert a T into a number, right? It just it doesn't compute. And it's the same way with, with Java here. So exceptions happen. And what you have to do is find a way to catch those exceptions. So typically what we'll do is we'll write a try block, a, a try catch block. And in that try, we'll, we'll, we'll set it up kind of like this. It'll be a try with the code. And then the catch is the exception. Now, this particular class right here is the generic exception that catches 90% of the uh, exceptions that occur out there. If you remember in our discussions of inheritance, everything extends from something else. Well, a lot of your exceptions, they extend from this parent class called exception. So if you write some code and it blows up, the idea is the catch will catch the exception and then you could do something with it. You could print out the message or, or whatnot. So you'll surround your code with a try block and this will be your normal code. This could be um, you performing a mathematical calculation. This could be um, opening a file. This could be any number of different things, but you're expecting the possibility that an exception would be thrown. And so the catch block then catches that exception and it allows you to normally, um, it allows you to normalize the code execution. If an exception is thrown and you don't catch it, the program will immediately stop, okay? It'll just immediately die. So it's important to talk about how you can catch your exceptions. All right, so, Common exceptions that exist. Um, end of file, EOF exception. So you have, you're reading from a file and you get to the bottom of that file and you try to read another element and it says, sorry, there's nothing here. And it throws an exception. Or you have an input mismatch exception. So you're expecting a certain type of input and they give you something different. Well, this is the common exception that will be thrown. And, and you can see here that this is typically thrown by the scanner. So if you're expecting text and the input, or expecting numbers and the input text or whatnot. Array index out of bounds exception. Has anyone experienced that exception yet? 
it occurs with, as you can guess, with arrays. You try to access an element beyond the last indice of the array. So if you have an array that is 10 elements long, it starts at zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and you think, oh, it's 10 items long, and you try to access indice 10, well, indice 10 is actually outside of the array, and it'll throw this array index out of bounds exception. Or if you try to open a file, a file not found exception, and you specify the wrong path to that file, it throws the exception. Or a very common one, arithmetic exception. And uh, if you try to divide something by zero, this exception will be, be thrown. All right, so you can also, in your code, you can throw an exception when you think uh, the state <clears throat> the state of the code should expect one okay um, you can you can add a throw new exception in your code if there's some type of logic condition that warrants it let's go back for a moment to IntelliJ and what I want you to do we're just going to close that we're going to open up a new project And where'd my mouse go? There it is. We'll call this week 13 examples. And inside the source, I want you to create a new Java class. And we're gonna call this um, um, my test class, okay? And we'll do a public static void main method, PSVM, hit tab. <coughs> and what we want to do is simulate an exception. So let's go ahead and use a scanner. And we're going to say scanner equals new scanner. And it's going to take a system.in. We're going to use a system out print line. Please enter a number between one, let's see, zero and 10. We'll do scanner next int. And I'm going to have this be my, I'm just going to call it um, num, okay? And what we want to do is we want to say if the num is less than zero, oops, there we go. We want to throw a new exception. And we're going to give it the message. And what is the message we want to pass into this exception? Your number is less than zero. Okay? Now, when I do that, what, what happens here? It's telling me, hey, I'm not handling the exception because now I have a potential situation where it, I, it could be uh, thrown. So what we'll do is we'll say try catch exception system out print line and I want to print the message. Everyone with me so far? Okay. Let's continue with our logic here. 
else if num is greater than 10, throw new except, exception. My grammar is bad. You number is less than zero. <laughs> All right, your number is greater than 10. Else, system out print line, that's a great number. All right. Seems kind of silly, right? But what we're demonstrating is the fact that you can actually cause an exception to be thrown if this is the scenario. Well, let's, let's take this logic a little bit further. Let's go ahead and do something like this. Let's do a public static void um, guess a number and I'm going to pass into it a scanner and what I want to do take all of that put it there and guess a number passing in a scanner. Now, let's add a little recursion. Everyone see what happens? Let me uh, blow this up a little bit. So we've got guess a number. Let's see if I can. We've got the call to it here. It takes a scanner. We input please enter a number between 0 and 10. We read the number. And we ask the question, if the number is less than zero, your number is less than zero. I threw an exception. So immediately, where does the logic go when I throw the exception? It doesn't, it doesn't continue. It goes all the way down to here. In fact, we could take it like this um, just to prove the point. When, if it hits this logic block, it's immediately going to come down to the exception. And it's gonna say, hey, here's the message, and please try again, and we call recursively the scanner. The scanner comes back up again, please enter a number between one and 10, and it does it again, All right? All right, so let's, um, let's run it and see what happens. Run the test. Oh, I'm missing something at line. Yeah, I forgot a. There we go. So let's. Here we go. Try it again. <clears throat> Please enter a number between 1 and 10. Let's enter a negative 1. Your number is less than 0. Please try again. Please enter a number between 1 and 10. Well, how about, how about a negative 2? Your number is less than zero. And I'm forcing the user now back into the same code without having to write fancy loops, 
but I'm controlling the user input through exceptions. You guys follow? Okay, so let's see if I enter 11, what happens? Your number is greater than 10, all right? What about 12? What about something like that? Yep, it's still greater. All right, well, how about one? That's a great number, and it exits the program. All right, any questions so far on what we did here with the try-catch block? Now, you can see in how you write your code then, say for like your project, if you're trying to control the input, you can control the input and force your user to, to go back and do it again, right? To save the information, okay? Let's go back to our slides real quick. Any questions before we go on? Anybody, anything that you don't understand? Gavin, you're, you're raising your hand. Do you have a question? Okay, let me go back. Yeah. Oh, in, like we have multiple exceptions in one try block, or we have to create another try block for a different for it to catch a different. We're going to cover all of these wonderful questions. <laughs> you're, yeah, you're actually you're thinking ahead. Good, right? This is good. Any other questions before we get to this new new piece of inf of uh, material? Okay, let's let's go back to the slides. So we have throwing our exceptions, right? Where program can throw any number of exceptions and you can also throw user-defined exceptions. Now, I'm gonna let you know, you do not have a PA or a CA on user-defined exceptions. Uh, they just added this to the uh, Zybooks material, but you can create your own exception and I'll cover this today and we'll, we'll talk about it, okay? Um, but you could have someone enter a date and you could pass in the, the message inside the exception invalid date, right? And it'll generate that, that information. All right, everyone understands what's happening here. The exception is thrown, it immediately throws you down into the catch block, skips over the rest of the code, doesn't, doesn't even execute it. So if you try, um, if you try to uh, put code after this, like num equals num plus one plus one, you see what's happening? It's, it's saying you can't do this because it's never going to get to that piece of code. As soon as the exception, as soon as this is, is thrown, it's going to jump to the the exception at the bottom, okay? All right. So you can use this to uh, check your code, just like we were, we were doing here. We're using it to, to trap user mistakes. And what you're gonna find, if you stay in software development, you're gonna find that users will do some of the craziest things. They'll enter, they'll enter things in, into your program that makes you wonder why would they ever do something like that? And it's just, it's just the way things are. And you as a programmer, you have to think, how do I capture every eventuality to lock down this piece of code? Okay, and, um, and what types of exceptions may occur? All right. So, multiple exceptions. We just kind of demonstrated this. I don't know if you guys can see it. We have a weight value, we're capturing it. If the weight is less than zero, invalid weight. If the weight, um, we, we do something else, throw invalid height, right? We calculate the BMI, um, and we could catch multiple types of exceptions here. So, let's go back to our code. For a moment, where'd my code go? 
let's ask the question that Gavin was asking. Can we have different types of exceptions? Well, let's run this again. And I'm going to input a T. Prime example, people entering bogus information into your program and you, it's like, no, T is not a number, right? But they still did it. And so how do you capture it? Well, if you think about it, this is this type of exception, input mismatch exception. So what you could do is you come down here and you could say catch input mismatch exception. And I'm going to do IEX for my variable name. And I'm going to say system out uh, print line, IEX, get message. And I really don't need to do that because it's going to be something bogus anyways. But we're going to say um, system out print line, you entered something that is not a number. And I'm going to call my guess number again, and pass in the scanner. All right. Now, if you're paying attention to this, you already see that an error message is being given in the code. And it's telling me the exception has already been caught. Well, has it been caught? Well, what happens here? Let's, let's go up. Input miss extends from no such element exception, which extends from runtime exception, which extends from exception, right? Make sense? So we really need to, um, we need to catch the exception before it's thrown. So how do we do that? Well, let me close these back down. Let's take our catch block and we're going to put it right here. We put it in front of it. So that we force the first type of exception that's caught, if there is any, will be this one. If it isn't, it'll be a regular old exception. Okay? All right, so let's test it. Run it again. Enter a number. Um, I'm going to enter the letter Q because I want to be a dork. Okay. And oh man, what happened? Let's see. Input mismatch exception creator. What did I do wrong? Let's go back and look at our code example over here and see if we can see this. So we're going to catch yeah let's see all right Make sure I'm paying attention to this. If weight is less than that, if that is that, that. Yeah. So right here, this is where you're catching the exception. If the input doesn't match an int, it's going to automatically come down here to the input mismatch. So let's go back. Try this again, we'll run it, enter Q, oh, what are we doing wrong here?
This is throwing me off. I wasn't pay didn't think about this. Eleven. Next int. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh. Duh. All right, y'all see what I did wrong? Understand why that's important? Yeah. Yeah, how was I ever gonna catch it if it wasn't in the tr inside the try block, right? Okay, so we'll run it again. <clears throat> I right, will enter the queue, and oh, ho, 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 something else happened. Like a stack overflow, didn't it? We could do that all day. You entered something that's not a number. Please enter a number between one and zero. So, oh, yeah. So you have to clear the, um, uh, what is the code there? If we look at their example, they've got it there. System out print, enter it. It's going to throw the exception. It comes down here, captures it, and right, it, it's exiting out. But because next int, we're looking to accept the next character, so you have to clear the buffer. For, um, so how do we clear the buffer? Well, we could do we could do something like this. We could say. Scanner uh, next or next line. There we go. Q. There we go. So that's that is a little bug, by the way, uh, inside of um, the scanner when you. You ask for something that doesn't have a new line break, and you're caught inside of an exception. It's going to it's going to automatically read again the rest of that line. And in our situation, because the code is set like it is, uh, when it reads the new line, it passes it back up to here, and it says, "Oh yeah, well." Yeah, it's not a number again, and it throws the exception. It's expecting the end of that, the termination, that new line character. So by the fact that we use a scanner next line to clear the scanner's buffer, now we're able to ask the question again. You guys understand? Some of you are like, not really, but I'll take your word for it, right? Just remember, it will do that. So here we're going to do less than one. We'll do 10, and it exits out. All right, any questions so far? All right, we're getting to a point here, though, with this code where it might make sense to have custom exceptions that align to the type of problem that you're expecting. So you could create a user-defined exception class that's called um, number greater than defined exception. Or you could create another one, number less than defined exception, right? And the benefit of those is you can actually control the exact exception information that you're catching. 
Okay, let's go back to our slides one more time. All right, so we already worked through that previous example. This is basically calculating BMI and you got multiple input exceptions. So you can also open accept, handle exceptions from, uh, from invalid files, so like a file input stream. And we kind of demonstrated that back about, what, three weeks ago, right? With um, reading parameters from a file, and you have to, you have to catch that file, and, and if it is, doesn't exist, it throws a file input exception. Um, these are automatically thrown if the path, the string that you give it, doesn't actually go to the file. If the file doesn't exist, that path doesn't exist, it will throw that exception automatically. Okay. All right, so here we have exceptions with files. We have a file input stream. This is the path that we're specifying. Then we're saying here's our file scanner, which is basically just a scanner. It's taking the file input stream that we specified here and if the file doesn't exist, it's going to throw this file input exception. And what we want to do is, is if no matter what happens, we want to check and make sure that we close the exception. And we do that by supplying this finally. So in the finally block, we would go ahead and ask the question, hey, file scanner, if you're not null, I'm going to go ahead and close you down, okay? And that's what you would do here, okay? All right, so you have uh, another example of doing this is called a try with resources, okay? A try with resources. Let me give you uh, a quick code example. I'm just going to pull it up off the internet. just so you could see it real quick. Okay, so with a try with resources, this is uh, from a very popular site I sometimes use called uh, Bell Dung. And the try with resources is basically like this. You say try and inside of the parenthesis, you specify the the thing that you're trying to do. And it automatically will close that resource once it's done. Okay, that's a try with resources. You can, this is basically replacing the try catch finally with one statement. Okay. So if we were looking at our code example, um, if this was a file, we would basically just have try, let, let me go back to the slide here. So you could see it. So with the slide uh, here, we would just move this whole parenthesis. We'd move the whole thing up here inside a parenthesis and have the declaration of the value, everything right there in the, the same block. Okay, any questions so far? All right, and the finally block. Okay, so specifying exceptions thrown by a method. Let's go back to our, our example again. And let's, let's do this a different way. Let's go ahead and create a new file We'll call this um, method exception test. I'm going to have a PSVM, public static void main method. I'm going to have a, let's see, a uh, method here, public static uh, void read number 
it's going to take a scanner and instead of being void let's have it return an int and I'm going to say this throws <clears throat> an exception so now we have a method that will throw an exception okay so if we try to use this method we'll have a scanner Please enter a number and we're going to read that number. Now, just in the by calling that method, what do we see that's what's happening here with our code? Well, it's telling us that we have to handle the exception. And at this point, there's really two ways we could handle the exception. We could handle it with a try block, try catch block, or we could go ahead and pass the exception all the way up to the, uh, the public static void main method. So we could say throws exception. Now, I want you to think about this, though. Why would this be good and why would this be bad? I mean, why would this, let's just ask the question, why would this be a bad decision? Yeah, it's not specific enough, but if we're thinking about handling users' exceptions, are you really handling their exception here? You're just passing it all the way up the chain and you're not doing anything with it, right? So we really want to think about instead of, you can do this, okay, but this is not generally the best idea. If this is going to throw an exception, then we have to handle the exception here, okay? Make sense? Okay, let's go back to our class again. So you can, you can specify all kinds of methods with exceptions on them, and you basically you are gonna say, hey, this method is going to throw, it throws an exception. And by doing that, you're, you have to, anything that uses that method now has to handle that exception. All right, any question so far? Yes? When will we use like the, just the throws exception at the top part of the public static uh, void main argument? Because since it does nothing, it'll just pass through it and then the exception won't get solved because there's nothing to do with it, right? Yep. Um, in this scenario, I don't think there really is a good thing about it from a design decision. If you're writing code and you know that the scope of your program ends with the public static void main method, putting a throws exception on that I think is a bad decision because If there is an exception that you don't know how to handle, or if there isn't, let me say this, if there is an exception that you want to handle, you now have the possibility that you're not going to handle it because you're throwing it right out, right out through the uh, exit of the program. Um, and if you throw it to the exit of the program, that means that what you, the condition or the scenario that you're hoping to, to catch, you're not going to catch it. Now, the fact that you can do it in Java doesn't mean that it's like you should do it, right? Um, when I was 
I was a, uh, a software developer at Fort Knox, Kentucky. I'll tell you something that someone did. They did this. Well, what system.exit does is it terminates the program. <laughs> okay, so um, we would create these things called WAR files. And a WAR file is an acronym that stands for Web Application Archive. Okay, and these Web Application Archives are basically uh, the technology that uses to encapsulate the file is the, it's the same as WinZip. You guys have used WinZip before, right? All right, so you, you group a bunch of files together, you zip them all up, and you call it a WAR file. We would deploy these onto a special application server called Tomcat. And Tomcat would take the WAR file, unzip it, and load it into these different directories. And when you would hit the web application, um, it would load and do all this stuff, right? It would give you it would give you web pages. It would generate HTML back to the user. Well, he this young developer he didn't know how to handle a particular scenario, and so he just he put into the program. First of all, he put into the program no log or no system out print line, so it hit the exception and you swallowed it. You didn't know what was going wrong, and then second of all, he put a system.exit. And what the system.exit did is it caused the entire Tomcat server to shut down. So every time they'd be working through the web application, the entire web, the entire web server would just shut down. Right? Because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it, right? But Java is very flexible. It's a very flexible language. You can do all kinds of cool things with it, right? Um, in general, never, never do just that. Because now you've erased what the exception is. And, you know, a problem could be going. Your program could still be running. And maybe, maybe this block is, is actually writing information to a database. Maybe it's writing it to a file. But as soon as it hits the exception, it just skips it and moves on. And you're like, well, I, you're looking through your logs. You're looking through everything. You can't see any evidence why um, it didn't work because, because of something like this. This is just bad practice. Never, this is called swallowing an exception. You never want to swallow it. You always want to do something with it. Either throw it again or print it to the logs so that it's, there's evidence of, that something happened and you want to be detailed with what happened. Okay? All right, any, any questions? Is it, everything I said makes sense so far? Okay. All right, let's go back. So you can specify uh, different exceptions and you can throw all kinds of exceptions, right? So here we're specifying exceptions thrown by an exception. So here is, we're getting the area, we've got a scanner, uh, we set a value for a circle area, we're printing, we're telling them, hey, give me, enter the area, we get the double, we assign it, we say if it's less than zero, throw a new exception, which you can see it's, it's available to bubble that exception up back to the whatever the caller is because it hits the exception though it never gets down to here to calculating the uh, returning the value okay all right now this gets to something that is actually a uh, important topic for you guys to know because there's two types of exceptions there are checked exceptions and there are unchecked exceptions so checked exceptions are things that you anticipate that you should be able to handle. For example, you say, hey, this throws an exception. That's a checked exception. Um, a file not found exception. If you can't find the file, it throws the exception. These are checks, right? Uh, back here in this code base, 
we were looking at in my test, these are checked exceptions because we are checking for criteria to happen, right? What happens here would be more of an unchecked exception. We're not expecting it to happen, but it could happen, okay? All right, so checked and unchecked exceptions. Checked exceptions can be caused by hardware, excuse me, unchecked exceptions could be caused by hardware. Like for example, you run out of memory, it's out of your control, right? Um, it could be things that you don't anticipate. It could be someone passing a null pointer to you. Do you guys know what null pointers are yet? Yeah. You guys need to experience the pain of a null pointer exception. Um, null pointer is basically I have an object and usually what do I do with that object? I instantiate it, right? Look back at this code here. I have an object that I set up here and I instantiate it with this right here, right? What happens if I do this, scanner equals null. Now, never in a million years would you null out your, okay, your object, but sometimes you're expecting that, that object to be injected, the dependency to be injected from another spot. And so you might declare your variable up front and say it's null and expect it later to be populated. But a null pointer exception in this, in this scenario, if we run the, um, I've got bad code up here somewhere. Where's this bad code at? Oh. Return. There. So it'll, oh, return zero. There we go. All right, so in my, my test, if I run this, just so you can understand what a null pointer is, as soon as this runs, it vomits, okay? Because a null pointer exception has occurred. And um, I try to call scanner.next, and this this part is dependent upon the object being fully instantiated. And if you call scanner.next without the object being fully instantiated, null pointer exception, right? Okay, so unchecked exceptions could be through null pointer exceptions. It could be through any, any various types of uh, situations. Checked exceptions are things that you expect. So you're throwing an exception and you're expecting it to be thrown. Unchecked, right? You don't expect it to happen. Um, if you guys go on into uh, software development later on and you're interviewing for a job, I guarantee you that checked exceptions and unchecked, uh, che unchecked exceptions will be one of the questions they ask you on your interview, okay? All right, so Java's catch or specify requirements with checked or unchecked exceptions. Um, you, you sometimes have to catch these. I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. We're going to move on. All right, so these are standard uh, um, unchecked exceptions, okay? No pointer, index out of bounds, arithmetic, I.O. exceptions, class cast exception, and a legal argument exception. These are all unchecked exceptions. These are the most common ones. Okay. And you can look at the names of these and really kind of figure out what the exception is all about. For example, arithmet arithmetic, arithmetic, there we go, da, 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 da. arithmetic exception, you, you kind of understand how that's going to occur. It's going to be through some type of math problem that blows up in your face, right? All right. So limitations, uh, a catch block that catches the exception type can catch exceptions of any type. And we just kind of demonstrated that earlier, right? When we looked at the input mismatch exception, we had to move the input mismatch exception from below to up top because 
it's first in, first out. So it hits the first one. If it matches it, if it's in the same hierarchy as far as uh, its parent is of that type, it will go into it. And this really gets to the point of defining user-defined exception types. Okay, So here we have an exception called NAN exception. This is not NAN as in your babe, okay? This is NAN is it as in not a number. All right, not a number. Um, and so we would say not a number extends from exception and we would throw that exception. All right, let's go back to our code again. And let's... Um, Let's create an exception. Let's create an exception called um, negative number exception. Now, by the rule of thumb is, is that if you're going to create a custom exception class, it should have the name exception in the class name. Okay. Again, this is one of those things that you, you can create the class without the exception being in it, but you really should specify in the name that this is an exception, okay? And I'm going to have this extend from, I'm gonna to go to runtime exception. And if we go to runtime exception, you can see that runtime extends from exception, okay? So I've got this exception class, and I need to generate a constructor. I'm gonna let IntelliJ do this for me, and I'm going to um, do those two right. Let's see. We're going to grab all three of those, all four of those, okay? And you can see that these call the super of its parent constructor. All right, so now let's create another exception class and we'll call this greater than specified number exception. And this is going to extend from runtime exception and again, we're going to generate the constructor. We're going to use all of the, the, the parent constructors in this. Okay. Now, let's go back to my test. And what type of exception can I use now? What was the name of that, that exception I just created? Yeah. Negative number exception. And this one we'll create is what? Okay. And so then down here, I could still leave this just as it is because a negative number exception, its great grandpa is exception. And it's still going to come down here. Right? Let's go into our negative number exception and let's do this. Oops, not too big. Let's see. And up here. So now, 
What do you guys think is going to happen? I know some of you are like, I have no idea, mister. We're, we're just following you right now. All right? Let's, uh, let's run it and see what happens. All right, so we're going to enter a negative number to test it. It took my message, and it appended, and it says, your number is less than zero. Please try again. Okay. Uh, how about 12? Too big. Your number is greater than 10. Please try again. Please enter a number. Oh, okay. Well, how about Q? You entered something that's not a number. Please. And I'm catching the exception, and I'm dealing with it, and, right? And the nice, thing, uh, the nice thing about doing it this way is I can specify certain messages in my exceptions that actually deal specifically with the type of exception that I want to pass along in my code, okay? So if your business logic requires, say, you, say you're working for Department of Finance and you're having to do some type of strange calculation, and if it doesn't match the calculation type that you're working for, the numbers, you could create a special, a special exception that will throw that exception based on custom logic. Okay? All right. Any questions so far? These are user-defined exceptions. We're going to move on then to the next topic, and this has to do with um, the comparable interface. So the best way I can think to explain this is let's go back to um, our class over here. Let's create a new class. And we're going to call this class uh, person. Okay? And our person class is going to have a private string first name, private string last name. We're going to give it a constructor. And let's go ahead and make this private uh, final, private final since we have this. And let's go ahead and create a getter. Okay. Now we have this class. It's a very simple class. It just has first name and last name, right? Um, but let's go back to, uh, let's go over here and we'll create a new class. And this will be my person array list test. Okay. Public static void main method. Um, I'm going to create a new array list. And, and what we're going to do actually is use list, the interface item. Okay. And I'm going to specify this list takes a person. And we're going to call this our persons equals new array list. And let's populate some persons. Okay, um, first name again. Irvin. Irvin. And last name? V I L L A R I N. Okay. Let's see. Francisco, right? Yeah. Okay. New person. Francisco. What's your last name? Okay. 
And we need one more name. Anybody else? Gavin? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Gavin? All right, so we have these names. Um, we could just do a simple four, and we're going to do person, P, and this is going to be persons. We'll print it out, right? P, uh, let's make this simpler for ourselves. Let's go down here, and in our person class, we're going to create a two-string method. There we go. That way I don't have to keep typing out a bunch of code. All right. Two string. All right, now if I run this, um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, there's my information. And right now it's in, um, it's in first name, EFG, right? First name order. But let's say I want to order this differently. How do, I, how do I do this? So what I could do is I could say uh, sort, or what is it? I'm trying to remember the, let's go back to our code here. Ah, there it is. All right, so I could do over here is type um, collections sort persons. What's it complaining about? And it's telling me I can't do that. Now, does anyone know why? I'll tell you why, is the contract says it has to extend comparable. All right, so how do we do this? If we wanted to sort by last name, what we would do is go into person and we would say implements comparable and I think it's like that, right? Okay, yeah, that's right. So now we have to implement the method, and the method is this, compare to. So we're going to say, okay. And you may have, may have been confused there because we had to type person, which was already listed here. But comparable is the interface. And the interface, it takes a type of T, and this is what we call generics. And so it could take any type that you want, but that type has to, be, uh, has to be the reference to it. And the method that it overrides is compare to. By the definition, compare to returns a number. And that number, if you look at the documentation here, it must ensure that the relationship is greater than zero in order for this to work. So it's one or zero, right? So when we look at the person class then, we have to do this, uh, this compare to logic. Let me go back to our code. Let's see. So slow.
Okay. So what we want to say if O last name compared to this last name, I think that's how we do it. So we're taking the reference of itself against the object passed in. Okay? Let me make sure I've got this right. I believe I got it right. So now we have compare to define. Let's go back to our test and we see it works. And what we're comparing is the last name now. And so we want this to be sorted appropriately. Boy, I hope this works because nothing worse than the teacher being wrong. All right. So we're going we're gonna to sort it, sort the items. And this list should now come out to be like, D E V, right? That's what we're expecting. So let's let's print it and make sure it see what happens. Did it do it? Not really, did it? All right. Bear with me one moment. Let's see here. Okay, where's my class at? Let me do this again. So we got this last name compared to O last name. Turn. Is that right? And what is that going to return? Compare to is going to return. Let's do it. Compare to, ignore case. All right. Run this again. There you go. DLG. It sorted it. You guys all see that? Okay. So. This allows you to, um, um, the comparable allows you to do some automatic sorting, sorting with, your, with your objects. All right, there's a couple other things we need to touch base on real quick here, and then we're going to call it quits for the day. Uh, these are generic methods. So imagine you have a method called triple min int. It takes an integer item one, item two, and item three. Then you have something that says the same thing, but this time it's characters. And typic, and really, honestly, you could do this with longs and so on and so forth. So the idea is, is you can create a generic. And in the generic, you would say, you would declare the type it, it, that it extends comparable. Very long syntax here, okay? 
and then you're passing in this type on the fly. And as long as these types all extend from uh, comparable, you can actually then pass in these generic, uh, generic objects. Okay, you're going to see this in your textbook. Um, we're running a little bit out of time today, so let's take a look at the last one. And the last is a generic class. Um, so this one deals with generic methods. And the big takeaway is this part right here. You have a generic method set up that can actually handle uh, integers or, or characters. And the last one is with a generic class. All right, let's take a look back at our code one more time. When we look at the person class, we see the example of the generics being defined right here. Okay. So if you look at comparable, comparable takes a type. And it says, okay, use that, that type to pass in whatever. So I've got my interface. I have one abstract method. That means that for my person class, when I implement this class, I have to also implement that abstract method compared to. Okay. You guys okay? Ezra, Gavin? You having a good time back there? Okay. All right, guys, any questions? All right. You have two labs this week. Um, they're not difficult. If you pay attention to what we've done today with the comparables, and, um, and the other one was with, um, let me take a look at it real quick. The other one is with the exceptions. Uh, you shouldn't have any issues. Everything we covered today actually covers what's in the labs. They're very straightforward. Okay? All right. Uh, I'll be behind for a few minutes if you need to chat. Otherwise, I will see you all next week. Uh, remember, next week your Project 3s are due. Project 3 is due. And make sure you get 10 and 11 finished. If you haven't caught up on those yet, make sure you get weeks 10 and 11 done.